Hi, I'm Susan Lloyd. Hi, I'm Keith Gosland, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Monday, November 11th. Keep that date in mind because as we talk about issues, things are still so much in flux. All Things LGBTQ is taped in Montpelier, Vermont at Orca Media. We recognize that we are taping on what is unceded indigenous land. So I'm gonna start right into it here. And this is our trivia question. This state has the most out LGBTQIA2S plus state legislators. Who might that be? And bonus points. This state has yet to elect an LGBTQIA2S plus state legislator. Who might that be? So looking at the correct camera now, I needed to switch. These are the events, Rainbow Umbrella, the Women's Discussion Group, Book Discussion Group. If you have an interest, please go look on the Facebook page for meeting times and if the meetings are in person or on Zoom. So Rainbow Bridge Community Center, we keep trying to promote them because they are doing such good work and reaching out to our communities and looking at what are our needs and responding to them. Keep in mind that they're doing an ongoing series that if you are a family who might have an interaction with DCF, either as a foster parent or any child custody issues, they're doing training on how to navigate the system. And right now, that's really critical because DCF has one of our youth that they're looking for a foster parenting situation. So if you've got interest, please reach out. And also they're doing the Ishtar Collective where there is a Paka Pop, where they reach out to our transgender communities and also the collaboration between Ishtar and the Wellness Center for Healthcare, which as we go forward is gonna become more and more critical. Fox Market. Board game night is back. Starting on Saturday, November 30th, 5 to 10 p.m. Play board games or all of all varieties. But there's a, a little caveat that says keep an eye on Liv stealing from the bank in Monopoly. Oh, Liv. I'm shocked. <laughs> keep in mind queer poetry reads once per month. They're also doing a Thanksgiving takeout dinner. I love that. And if you're interested, you need to get your orders in by the end of day on Sunday, November 24th, and pick it up on Thursday between 9 and 12. On Thanksgiving. That's what it says oh. on their website. All right. And we'll be posting their menu. I was going to say. So that, you, <laughs> so that you can salivate and get ready. Out in the 802, you know, if it's a Thursday night, there's a pop-up someplace. And the one that happens in St. Albans is a game night. Okay. Bring your favorite game. Invite people to join you. You could practice and then go to Fox Market. Exactly. I love that. And keep an eye on Liv. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Out in the 802 is also doing one of their pop-ups, uh, potlucks, on November 24th. And, ah. if, and looking at the photos they've had from their previous potlucks, there looks to be more women attending these events than there has traditionally been. Mm -hmm. So- And where's that? Well, you need to go on their website uh, or their Facebook page to get that information. And then you need to register as you know, a guest participant. Gotcha. Out in the open in Brattleboro, they're doing a Trans Day of Remembrance on Wednesday, November 20th at 6 p.m. You know, go onto their site, get all of the details where they're, they're congregating. And they say, join us for apple cider, hot chocolate, a round of fun, fire to honor and celebrate our community together. So, nice. and we haven't mentioned this in a while, but 
out in Bradford, the second Friday of each month at 5 p.m. at Vittles House and Brew. They say no agenda. Mm. You know, just come and spend time. And we want to put out there again, as reported by Boston Spirit, the winter rendezvous mm -hmm. is happening in Stowe, January 22nd through the 26th. And this event was nominated for the best ski week Ooh. in the US. And also on November 23rd, the Stowe Theater Guild at the Fox Gallery and Music Hall is sponsoring a reading and performance by Toussaint. Mm -hmm. And Toussaint will also be doing book signings nice. of their book, Mountain Spells. Mm -hmm. And what we had reported on the last show, and it had escaped me, Toussaint was nominated to be the Poet Laureate for the state of Vermont. Wow, so, awesome. So with that, Wow, that's a lot. <clears throat> I have to clear my social calendar. I, you've got th we've got things to do. I, we do have things to do. So I'm going to start by with a couple of international stories, and then I'll get into some domestic stories. So uh, the first is the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, and Intersex Association has turned down a bid to host their world conference in Tel Aviv. Oh. They've decided that will not go forward and will not be put to a vote. They've sort of they're taking That's a stand it. here. That's it. Uh, the World Conference is set to be in Cape Town, South Africa. They held an emergency meeting and unanimously voted, decided to remove the bid. And it's also decided to suspend the organization from its membership. Yeah, they're taking a hard line there. Right. Tokyo. A second Japanese high court has ruled Wednesday that the government's policy against same-sex marriage is unconstitutional the latest in a series of decisions upholding plaintiffs' demands for marriage equality. The Tokyo High Court called the ongoing ban a groundless legal discrimination based on sexual orientation, saying it violates the constitutional guarantee of right to equality, as well as individuals' dignity and equality between sexes. It was a, clear statement than the, a clearer statement than the 2022 lower court decision that described it as an unconstitutional state. Anne's, Anne's been following Japan very closely. Nice. I liked this story. Uh, you have to go. A gay pub kicks a man out for wearing a Donald Trump cap. Ooh. <laughs> this is in Brisbane, Australia. So if you're paying attention at home, these are all places we're going to visit and, <laughs> or potentially move to. Although side rent, Belize, $8 US a day. Let's start packing, Keith. Okay. Damn. Anyway, a man was kicked out. Oh, he demands an apology because he claims there was no legitimate reason to being asked to leave. He was kicked out for wearing a Donald Trump hat. Robert Holt was at the Wickham in Fortitude Value with his family for a Halloween event on Sunday. First of all, the Wickham. What? Yes. Okay. What self-respecting straight man goes into a gay pub with his family? That sounds like a joke. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> he went in there. He told Sky News that he'd been at the venue for a couple of hours when a staff member from behind the bar approached him and asked him if he was leaving. <laughs> That's subtle. Are you on your way out? And the door might be in that direction. <laughs> There's the door. When he asked why, Mr. Holt said the staff member said it was because of his Trump hat, which said Trump 2024. The bartender said, people around here don't feel safe with people wearing items of Trump branded clothing coming into, into this pub. You have to go. I love that. Mr. Holt said he could understand if the hat had some offensive language on it or a rude gesture, but it didn't have anything like that. Some would question the language being a triggering. Anyway. A rude on. gesture, yeah. Rude gesture. Uh, moving on to domestic news. The University of Nevada forfeits a game rather than playing against a possible trans athlete. For the fifth time, a uh, women's volleyball team has chosen to forfeit instead of playing against San Jose State University because of rumors that one of its players is a transgender woman. The University of Nevada announced that it would forfeit because they, quote, refuse to participate in any match that advances injustice against female athletes. The vast majority of our team decided this is something we wanted to take a stand on, said the team captain. We didn't want to have to play against a male player. 
Boo. Okay, so you use the term rumored. Yeah. Is it yet yeah. to be... I don't know. Has the team yet to disclose that, yes, indeed, we do or do yeah. not? They're just saying It did not say nothing. in the article. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Right? Speaking of transgender, I found a couple of interesting articles. Over the past few years, many have speculated that more young people now identify as transgender. So there was, there was some survey done. <clears throat> Among all adults, identifying as transgender increased from 0.53, five out of 1,000 in 2014 to nine out of 1,000 in 2023. That's a 68% increase. And even, but even in 2023, the number of American adults identifying as transgender is still less than 1%. The increases are much larger among 18 to 24 year olds, a 422% increase. And the question was, why has identifying as trans increased so much more among young adults? So then they did more digging, right? The answer <clears throat> immediately becomes political, as it says here. The left's favored explanation is greater acceptance, right? The challenge to this is that there was no change in identifying among older adults mm -hmm. if people were truly accepted. Those on the left say that there may have been a greater increase in acceptance among young people compared to older people. And it's also possible that it's much harder to upend your life by identifying as trans when you're 35 or older. And it says that when Gen Xers and Boomers were younger, being trans wasn't accepted, uh, and therefore it may be harder for them. They feel less acceptance. But wait for it. The political rights explanation is what they call social contagion. Yeah, I got it. Have you heard this? Yeah, Social yeah. contagion? Yeah. What the hell? Um, the, the idea of being trans is spreading like a virus or something, you know, among certain groups, yeah. especially among young, uh, as, it's, as it says, especially among girls and young women, also known as people assigned female at birth. You know, let's be a little more politically correct. Uh, anyway, so that's interesting. Whatever the case, what, what the article says is, whatever the case is, you would expect to see higher percentages in more liberal states than, than uh, more conservative states, but, but actually that's not the case. It's pretty even across our nation, which the article sort of putting forth, positing that online and social media may have a much larger role than regional, oh. local, or national communities. Well, it, it had, I mean, that was, very true during, for messaging during this most recent election year. I want to go back to a fundamental question, which is how are they defining transgender and does transgender include someone who identifies as non-binary? I believe it does. Okay, because yep. the non-binary <clears throat> under the transgender umbrella, it's I'm not necessarily saying that I want to engage in gender affirmation right. processing, right. I'm not identifying within the binary. Exactly. So, okay. Yeah. So you would think that number the, would be the, even the, higher. Exactly. When you when you have that exactly. Mark. Yeah. But along those lines, uh, and not surprising, uh, reproductive and gender affirming healthcare providers are seeing triple digit increases in orders and inquiries after Donald Trump's election mm -hmm. to a second term. People are trying to plan yeah. for the reproductive apocalypse. Yes, stockpiling. The One of these sites um, saw a 625% increase in traffic following the election results. In Maine, a district judge ruled that the United States military discriminated against two transgender women by refusing them coverage of gender-affirming surgeries under the military health plan, TRICARE. So that was some good news. Uh, let's see. Sean Mendes, do you know him? He's a young mm -hmm. singer. Uh, I, I love this. It says he addresses his sexuality, but then listen to what he says. Nothing at all. <laughs> I guess... I'm just speaking freely now because I want to be closer to everyone and just kind of be in my truth. The real truth about my life and sexuality is that I'm just figuring it out, like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's all I really want to say about that. 
Okay, that's so like, that's, that's like a non-saying saying. That's like the 80s definition of metrosexual. Yeah. I'm not really sure, so I'm just playing yeah. everything and seeing w yeah. who, who responds back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Boeing, did you hear about this, dismantles their diversity yeah. department. The staff from Boeing's DEI office will reportedly be combined with another human resources team focused on talent and employee experience. They've dismantled their global diversity, equity, and inclusion departments. The report said that staff from Boeing's DEI office would be combined with other human resources team focused on talent and employee experience. Not surprisingly, the head of that department has left the organization. Probably ran screaming. Uh, in Gay History Month, do you know this person? I might be butchering their name. Zeki Murin? No. Z-E-K-I is a queer icon and musical star you may have never heard of. Turkish. Oh my yeah. gosh. Oh, you're good. Keith, you're yeah, good. Turkish. You're good. I'm going to send a picture. Yeah. Because I love this picture. He looks like a combination of like David Bowie <laughs> and uh, Liberace. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he apparently in the 60s and 70s, yeah. Keith. Yeah. Yeah. He dressed in mm -hmm. uh, female clothing. So picture Liberace, but singing rock songs, right? That sort of look. Z Ziggy Stardust. Exactly. He blended traditional Turkish music with more modern sound. And he never officially came out, although he was wildly popular. So I'm, I'm going to go check him out anyway. Uh, Grammy nominations. A lot of queer artists and uh Allies have been nominated. So Billie Eilish, uh, Chappelle Rowan, <coughs> Lady Gaga, and Ariana, Ariana Grande. Okay, what else? I want to be mindful of the time here. So yeah. a couple of other things on, we have a hometown hero, a man named Steve Arrington has been fighting for civil rights and the rights of people living with HIV and AIDS for most of his life. Not unlike his hero, Bayard Rustin, that's a great movie. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I pronouncing his name correctly? Um, we also had some winners of a <clears throat> kind of, um, I don't know what the, what the contest was, but these people were all nominated as LGBT heroes. We had another person who called herself an accidental activist. I love that. I love that phrase uh, named, uh, what is her first name? Uh, Kawamoto, she identifies as trans, and she has uh, worked to come out. She came out as a woman four years ago, and she said, I've been, I had been completely denying my existence as to who I'm, I'm supposed to truly be. And it was the oddest thing of just walking in this town and seeing this beautiful dress in a store window, and I saw my reflection on the head of the mannequin. I, lo I love that image, right? And then all of a sudden, everything snapped. It was like, oh my gosh, this is who I'm supposed to be. There are two... <clears throat> Two recent sort of acknowledgments. One was the Out 100, mm. and the other one was the Washington Blade. Nice. Both of them were looking at, okay, who are the people that we want to recognize? Nice. All right, a couple more. Uh, you probably remember this, as I certainly do. A controversy around Al Pacino's film Cruising. We reported on this on the last show. Did you? Yeah. That he has donated all the money yeah. that he made from that? That was cool. Too little, too late. But, well, okay. yes. Uh, okay, and a finally in this segment, a woman baffled after her boyfriend said he temporarily turned gay on a work trip, but now he's straight again. <laughs> I threw this in just for you. Kate. I'm not going there, <laughs> and you can't make okay, me. Okay, but check this out. It gets better. A woman has turned to the Internet for advice after she discovered her boyfriend of three years enjoyed a hookup with another guy while on a work trip. She believed her boyfriend to be fully straight. He too claims to be fully straight. However, he is admitted to a sexual encounter with another guy and blames, wait for it, the altitude. <laughs> All right, for, that's like the Twinkie defense. For, okay. for temporarily taking leave of his senses and turning him briefly gay. That's his excuse, and he's sticking to it. He insisted he was not gay at all, but the strangest thing happened. He said that when he was at dinner with his Utah co-workers, we've always suspected Utah, right? Mm -hmm. He suddenly became gay, the woman said. I was like, what? What the, you know? He said he thinks it was due to the altitude. She said, 
you're effing with me. But he said after he'd done it with this guy, he got really confused as to how all of a sudden he was gay. He said that he read somewhere that higher altitudes can have an impact on how people think and on their emotions, and he thinks that the high altitude made him gay temporarily. He said as soon as he landed back home, he was back to being straight. Some of the funny comments related to this on Reddit, one person said, does that mean anytime you're in the air, you're gay? Well, I, I'm like, does that mean we should all go to Aspen? I, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to spend time talking about politics in the election. Oh, act surprised. <sighs> and I'm going to encourage you to ask lots of questions okay. because... I will there ask is so much packed into what has happened and looking at it from a critical perspective and figuring out how we now move forward. Mm -hmm. what, what is the new now? And what do we really have for options? What I'm glad you didn't say the new normal because there's nothing normal about this. I, I, I worked in mental health for too long to use <laughs> the term normal. I usually use traditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to start in Vermont, and then I'm going to back into the national level and some of how what is happening on a national level then might impact what it is we do in Vermont. So the first thing we, I want to look at is we had 12 out LGBTQIA2S plus legislators when we went into this election cycle. We now have 11. But it's not necessarily, you know, we lost one. What ended up happening is we actually lost two out legislators. One is Josie Levitt in the Grand Isle Chittenden District, which we had cited on previous shows as being a concern. It was a targeted district mm -hmm. by the Republican Party. And it's a district that has gone back and forth. And during the last election, Josie had only won by nine votes. So <clears throat> the other was a bit of a surprise, and it was Mike Rice in the Bennington-Rutland district. Mm. But I think what happened is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the Phil Scott's messaging and how he brought people on his coattails. There were strong Republican gains in Essecourt, Orleans, Chittenden North and Franklin County, R Addison and Rutland County. So the Bennington Rutland district would have been in that overflow. Mm -hmm. But we gained a new out member in Will Greer in the Bennington 2 district. Huh? And Will was somebody who was highlighted both by Boston Spirit and the advocate. Nice. As when elected, at 21, he may be the youngest out legislator wow. in the country. So also, Emma Mulvaney Stanek was the organizer for the Rainbow Caucus in our legislature. And she is now the mayor of Burlington. And there is rumors that Emily Kornheiser, who was reelected, may be taking over that role, and we've reached out for confirmation. Mm -hmm. Because we would really like to talk about, OK, what is going to be the role of the Rainbow Caucus and the Diversity Caucus in the upcoming session? Going into this election year in the House, we had 107 Democrats, 37 Republicans, two progressives, three independents, and one libertarian. After the election, we have 88 Democrats, mm. 55 Republicans. That's a gain of 18. Wow. Four progressives <clears throat> and three independents still. And looking at the Senate, prior to the election, we had 22 Democrats, seven Republicans, and one progressive. After the election, we have 16 Democrats. 13 Republicans, <gasps> they picked up six Ooh. and one progressive. So what happened? As was reported on numerous shows and concerned Ray's, 
Phil Scott's messaging was all about, I need common sense legislators who will help me move us forward. The Republicans in the state of Vermont followed what was happening on a national level. They had a focused message. They talked about the rise in your property taxes and can you afford to live here? It was their single message. And even though the Democrats and the progressives had a very aggressive door-to-door -door knocking campaign talking about a wealth of issues, they did not have a single response to what the Republicans were coming out with. So here was this strong argument and people sitting back saying, I just saw a 14% increase in my property taxes. The Democrats had nothing to counter that with. Mm. There was nothing to come back with. The question, however, now becomes, OK, you got your reasonable legislators. Does that mean you're finally going to come to the table? You got them. Now what are you going to do? My question, we were talking about this earlier, is talk a little bit, if you would, about the impact of Scott with the down ballot. You said, oh, that, he, you this, said that he had, this was sort of historic. He had never so actively campaigned for his own party down ballot. Right? Well, and, and that gets into to the next piece, sort of next aspect I was going into yeah. is the president-elect got 32% of the vote here in Vermont. That's the most he has ever gotten. Who are that 32%? And you know, are they MAGNA supporters? MAGA. <laughs> but keep in mind that Vermont went for Nikki Haley during the primary. So who is it that showed up to vote? Mm -hmm. And yes, indeed, Phil Scott essentially in previous elections has distanced himself from and not been actively involved in Republican politics. This is the first time he went out county to county mm -hmm. advocating on behalf of people running for election. Well, he also, this is the first time he was actively involved in He was also in on ads. I heard ads where he said, John Rogers, right, and different. Well, they did, they did a combined, <clears throat> and they were successful. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, it was the single messaging, you know, we want to make it affordable and there was no counter argument. Mm. So one of the things that we're going to need to be attentive to, you know, there is this increased Republican presence. We like to think that we're a state that honors diversity, inclusion and equity. But during the last session, we saw two anti bills get introduced. And it was a core of nine Republicans, legislators that introduced them into the House. One was a health care provider bill of rights. If you have a religious or moral exemption, moral exception, or... well, it, it would be an exception for religious or of conscience. This is not a procedure that I can support, mm -hmm. so I don't have to participate in it. And we saw UVM get caught in on this, on the Medicaid reimbursement with a nurse who said, I do not support abortion and you force me to participate. So, mm. and the other is a ban in sports that, you know, as you were reporting on, mm -hmm. you know, no transgender athletes participating, particularly in women's sports. So I also want to look at, you know, there are things that are going to start happening on the federal level that are going to impact funding. Mm -hmm. So what, which of our LGBTQ plus organizations rely upon federal funding? Rainbow Bridge does not receive any federal funding. So they're not going to be impacted. However, outright Vermont does. Mm -hmm through both the Department of Education, through the Department of Health, and through some direct funding. So we're going to need to be watching really closely. Out in the open in Brattleboro does not receive any federal funding. Vermont CARES, a huge chunk is through the Department of Health and the HIV and AIDS funding. <coughs> ORCA 
does not receive any federal funding. And I asked about this because part of Project 2025 is to defund the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and looking at how they can impact the public media. Mm. You know, freedom of press, freedom of expression. It's overrated. Well, <laughs> If all of a sudden we disappear, you know what happens. The administration is going to start looking at if they can't do something directly with the funding you receive, either restricting it or putting definers on what you can and cannot do. Remember that when we talk about schools, they're going to look at your licensing and certification when it comes out. Keith, what about so, organizations like Planned Parenthood and... Oh, they're, I mean, they're going to take a huge hit because let's let's move now into the national. And I, I want to start with some positives first. Bless you. Yeah, there we go. That it was. This will be the most LGBTQ plus House of Representatives ever that while the up, the presidential, was not where we hoped to be, some of the down tickets, it looks as though all of our incumbent out representatives were reelected and there were some that were added, most notably Sarah McBride coming out of Delaware, who will be the first openly trans legislator, legislator in the U.S. House, and Julie Johnson mm -hmm. coming out of Texas. Texas. Who will be the first out legislator coming from a southern state. Yes. Now, the Victory Fund was following 477 out candidates. And as of 1030 on November 11th, Keep that date in mind. That's, that's 283 had been elected, and this is all tiers from federal down to the local level. Mm. 68 had lost, and they were still waiting on 126 to be decided. Wow. So that's actually a really good night for us. However, looking at what just happened on a national level, the Republicans did gain the majority in the Senate. They have 53. But I want you to keep that 53 count in mind because there is a policy in the Senate that most bills are subject to the filibuster, which means you need 60 votes. Mm -hmm. The exception to that are unfortunately confirmation of the judicial, where it's a simple majority. Mm. I mean, think of Mitch McConnell, who had rammed through mm -hmm. all of those appointments. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is a reconciliation process, and that's specific to budget issues. It can only be budget issues. You cannot tack additional things on, which has been attempted in the past. And the Senate parliamentarian will rule on any amendment either being germane or not. <clears throat> and okay. who is that? I don't know the name of who it is. Hmm. But they, you know, they look at Gonna what are the rules and how do they... You know, are they and is that an appointed position or somebody based on their length of tenure? Like, is it a Democrat or no, a Republican? It's, it's, it's length a, of tenure. So... No, it, it's so, not politically affiliated. Okay. And what they look at is what are the rules of the chamber? Okay. What can you or can you not do? And the reconciliation is clearly defined. Hmm. And it has gotten greater clarity over the years because of how administrations have tried to, man or the, pa the party in control has tried to manipulate the process. So is this role meant to be objective and just looking at the rule of law? Bingo. And, okay, gotcha. Well, the, the policies the, of, the, of chamber. the chamber. Okay. It has to be a budget only. 
what you're doing has to be germane. And then there is a criteria of what is the impact of the budget amendment that you are making on the overall budget or the deficit. Mm. So there are lots of things in play. The House is still in flux, but the expectation is that the Republicans will take the, the majority. They're currently at 214. They need 218. I think I saw to, something this morning that they were breaking news that they were... They were close. Mm -hmm. There are 203 Democrats, and there's still 18 seats undecided. And they think that the 18 are going to break, you know, the... The Democrats are definitely going to gain, but there's going to be enough to put the Republicans over the 218. So, and Mike Johnson is most likely coming back as Speaker of the House. In the Senate, Mitch McConnell is not choosing to stay in a leadership position. But it's really unclear. There were three contenders. The president-elect is already saying you need to make a commitment now that you will go into session during recess so that they could do both appointments to, for the judicial vacancies and also to fill their cabinet because they can do interim appointments that will basically be the same as somebody who has been confirmed by the Senate but they don't have to go through the Senate confirmation process. <laughs> really quickly, because I am running out of time, <clears throat> thing, time, things that the president-elect said that they were going to do on day one um, and how it may impact Vermont. But, but first, before I forget, one of the things that we should keep in mind is the president-elect actually received 4 million less votes than they did in 2020 when they lost to mm. Biden. Mm. And Camilla actually received 17 million less votes than Joe Biden did in 2020. That would make you think that there were 20 million, 21 million people who voted in 2020 that sat out during this election. What happened? Day one, <laughs> close the southern border. Now we need to look at. Is that we be, also we is that also before lunch or after lunch. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. It's during snack. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How does that impact the northern border? Hmm. I mean, if you're talking about border and closing it down, well, we have one. The president-elect has also talked about using local law enforcement and the National Guard. Uh, the president doesn't have that authority. That rests with the state. They would have to federalize, which means they have to declare a state of national emergency in order to activate the National Guard. The Insurrection Act? Mm, Wouldn't that be ironic? That sounds familiar. They're looking at firing Jack Smith, which doesn't surprise us. Those cases will go away. Pardoning those people who have already been prosecuted for the January 6th insurrection. Um, and the Green New Deal, New Day, and climate change. Vermont gets a lot of federal funding based upon the Green New Day deal. Mm. And it's what's been able to support our initiatives. What's going to happen there? And are we ready to step in and pick up? Mm. They also want to dismantle the Department of Education and end federal funding of schools. They don't have that authority. That's Congress. The only thing that the president can do relative to manipulating monies is if there is a contingency clause that's in part of the budget. This money can be used if it is needed for this. That then gives the president the authority to step in and decide how that money gets used and when it gets used. But what they're looking at for it, and remember DeVos during the last administration where she actively moved to get rid of public schools, charter schools, 
put containments on what schools can do. They're looking at eliminating all DEI initiatives. Vermont is in the forefront with that. And eliminate, in history classes, any reference to slavery or critical race theory. Want to do a national don't say gay initiative. You cannot talk about issues of sexual orientation or gender identity in a school setting. Um, get away with mandated vaccinations. Ban trans women from sports. Mm. And Vermont has, again, been in the forefront of all of our athletes get to compete according to their gender identity. And looking at gender identity, they want a congressional action that there are only two and is what's assigned it at birth. They want to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Think about where you get your health insurance. And they want to eliminate all of the HIV and AIDS programs, both prevention and treatment. And you had a question. I had a question, right? And I, you know, this might be naive, but I'm, I'm looking for something to cling to. Give me some hope here, Keith. No pressure. Okay. I wanted to know what we can do here in our brave little state of Vermont to shore up some of our laws to sort of try to push out some of the federal bad things that are, <laughs> that's my technical term, things that, that may be happening during this term. Are there things that we can be doing? to we, protect some of the rights we have here in Vermont. OK, and the answer is we're not in this alone. The Democratic governors and Democratic attorney generals have already been talking about what they're prepared to do and how to do it. Vermont has already done the things that we can. Mm -hmm. We've put in place on a constitutional level the rights and protections that we believe every citizen should be afforded. And looking at actions coming down, are we willing to challenge them? You know, are we willing to file suit? And, and probably we will be joining other states in that initiative. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind that is that federal law overrides state unless there's a direct challenge that the federal law is unconstitutional. And being in too many roundtable conversations recently, people are ready to mobilize. The ACLU is ready to act. You know, Lambda Legal. There are numbers of legal entities who have learned from the previous administration what their tactics might look like, how to approach them, and the argument to be raised against them. The one piece that we need to keep in mind is that there is a conservative Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Are we framing an argument that by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, we may get a decision that we do not want. Mm -hmm. and, and where do we hold? One of our best hopes is executive orders you know, are at the whim of whoever is sitting in the Oval Office. Can we delay and stall until the next election and hope that there is a more favorable administration in play? Thank you, I think. <laughs> It, it, it's, there is hope, but it's going to be work. Yeah. And now for something positive. Everybody remember positive. Uh, I've been looking. I had to dig deep, people, to find cause for hope and find some positive things to, to, to talk about today. And uh, I read a couple, I read a bunch of articles uh, from The Advocate, and they have a section that they call kind of tell me something good, right? Good news. So. It's been a very hard week, they said, and it's an emotional time, and it's good to express our feelings, both alone and with others, and keep in mind that 70 million people voted for progress and equality and decency, and we're all heading into the future with those 70 million people. And of course, throughout history, we have been healers, artists, and warriors, and caring neighbors, and now we need to, need to do it again. That's our magic power. So I wanted to talk about a couple of things. The first was uh, Rachel Maddow. I love her, just got to say. She dropped a perfectly timed gay joke just when we needed it most. Uh, she, it's a stressful day for Americans, of course. She sent her colleagues into hysterics. So, so one of her colleagues said, don't sleep on men. So pay attention to the male vote, said her fellow host, Nicole Wallace. 
And Maddow said, I've been saying that my whole life. <laughs> I've Good heard. going, Rachel. <laughs> I know, right? And then uh, talking about some some members of our community that we all applaud, a couple things to hold on to in these in these dark times. Remember that California made its state a sanctuary for trans kids and their families. Governor Newsom signed a bill to protect all those transgender rights. So California is doing its part. Uh, neighbors. Uh, there's an example of a, there was a heated public debate in the Greenville County Council in South Carolina. They voted to keep LGBTQ books accessible to children at their public library. There was a resolution from the city council saying that they didn't want to uh, have books on the shelves that promoted sexuality. I always love to add what those books are, just to give you a sense. You know, these aren't porn people. Uh, one of them was called Daddy and Dada. I mean. Yeah. Tio's Tutu, about a young boy who wanted mm -hmm. to do ballet. And sex is a funny word, which is a sex education book designed for kids that teaches about different types of families. Uh, Susan Ward, who's the parent of a gay son, emphasized how important it is for her son to be able to see himself in books. This is what I've been trying to say to my friends all along. We went to see uh, an LGBTQ plus uh, comedian. And I was with some of my loving ally straight friends and they kept saying things like, I don't get it, that wasn't funny, they, they're picking on us. And I said, welcome to my world. Exactly. Right? And it was so empowering to hear that voice in comedy without it being offensive, right? Anyway, I digress. Uh, so they won the vote to keep those books on the shelf. And then also I thought this was fun, speaking of seeing ourselves, um, Melissa Etheridge recently said that the L word was based on her life and her friends. I love oh, that. That's right. I always she saw the L word. Uh, the L word to me was always sort of that soft porn. You know, it was always intriguing to watch because, again, you didn't see, you didn't often see yourself in film or media. And she said it was written about what happened that the. Um, the person who created the show was was part of her group, uh, and that she said, I didn't necessarily have to watch The L Word because I lived it. Her backyard was an open house with a lot of drinking, cannabis smoking, and a whole lot of fun because none of them had kids back then. She also said, I thought this was interesting, that many celebrities came to her for advice on coming out. And she said, uh, it's up to you. You don't have to explain anything to me. Uh, but there are a lot of people that have since come out as a result of attending those parties. And people would say to her, you all seem to be having so much fun. And we've all been saying that since the 70s, haven't we? Absolutely. We've been having fun. Um, she added a message for today's uh, leaders pushing anti-LGBTQ legislation across the country that when you define yourself by what you're against, ultimately people will see that you're not for anything. And there's a generation coming up behind us that thinks we're all very foolish. She said, I have children and I meet their friends and their generation are gonna look back on this just how we looked back on the horrible bigotry of the 50s and 60s and to all of those politicians, I would say, your legacy is not going to be a revered one. And that's the hope, the younger people. Mm -hmm. I think about my daughter. They don't fuss over a lot of the things we perseverate about. They just believe in equality. And they don't have all the labels we have. And they don't have all the baggage, maybe, some that we have. Uh, Saturday Night Live, last weekend, not two days ago, but last weekend, had, uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly, Chappelle Rowan sang a song, a brand new country song, about a lesbian on Saturday Night Live. Did you see this? Now no, I, have to I go, heard about and it. And I have to go watch this trip, uh, the, that clip. Uh, the words, uh, some of the words, she, uh, the chorus or the verse, I know the boys may need a map, but I can close my eyes and have you wrapped around my fingers like that. Ooh, Ooh so baby, when you need the job done, call me. <laughs> I love that. Saturday Night Live. Uh, and I also just wanted to read something about Jamie Lee Curtis. Did you hear about this? Yes. Jamie Lee Curtis, who's not only an Academy Award winning actress and LGBTQ plus ally, but she also has a transgender daughter. 
She says that gay and trans people are more afraid now that President-elect Donald Trump has won the election. And she said, so the results are in. Many will be celebrating, possibly even gloating over their victory. Many will be stunned and sad with the terrible feelings of the loss. That is the same result despite who wins, because that's what America and democracy looks like, has always looked like, she said. So what does it mean, she continued. It means a sure return to a more restrictive, some fear, draconian time. Many fear their rights will be impeded and denied. Many minority groups and young people will be afraid. Gay and trans people will be more afraid. We know that many women will now find it difficult to get the reproductive health care that they need and deserve. For all those people, there will be those who will help you, me included, she added, before saying that people will also have to wake up and fight for women and our children and their futures and fight against tyranny one day at a time, one fight at a time, one protest at a time, because that's what it has always meant to be an American and will always mean regardless of the outcome. So, so thank you, Jamie Lee. So looking at some more positive stuff. Yes, please. There were four states mm -hmm. that LGBTQ plus equality was on the ballot. Mm -hmm. California, Colorado, and Hawaii. Voters were asked to remove language banning marriage equality from their state laws, just in case the Supreme Court as Clarence Thomas wants to do, mm -hmm. rolls back Obergefell's decision. It passed in all three states. Yes. So marriage equality is guaranteed, and some of them is at their constitution level, not just a statutory level. Nice. So regardless of what the Supreme Court rules, marriage equality will still be the law of their land. And New York, mm. the same as Vermont did during our last election, has now added protections for sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, as, as well as reproductive rights within their state constitution. Again, in anticipation of what it is that might be coming. Mm -hmm. So looking at, this was a statement that I was asked to sign on to, but because I am no longer in a position of leadership with an organization, I needed to decline. But this was put out by chairs and executive direction directors of some of our national LGBTQ plus organizations. We are with you in grief, rage, and fear. In these early days, we must reach for each other, feel our feelings, and recommit to our deepest values, justice, solidarity, and care for one another. So, thank you. And I just wanted to say, um, now is a time to really lean on your friends and the supports that you have in your life. Uh, I know that that's been really critical for me, and I really have appreciated in the last week or so just reconnecting with people that share my values and that you know, really care about our future together. And particularly love, Keith, and all the research that you do and all the hard Thank work you. you do to put this show together. And of course, Anne and Linda, thanks for letting me sit in. And I really appreciate the passion that everybody here has to try to make a difference in our community and our brave little state. So I want to thank everybody and just share how much I appreciate what everybody does here. Thank you. And the day after the election, I was grocery shopping. And someone noticed all of the stickers on the back of my car came up to me and said, how are you doing today? I want to let you know you're not alone. Love that. Thank you. I love that. So this state has the most out LGBTQIA2S plus state legislators. That might be Vermont. Yes. And again, we have 11 now. Woo. This state has yet to elect an out legislator. And Anne would know this. Anne knows this. Because it's Louisiana. Oh, OK. There are currently 235 
out state legislators across the country. Sweet. However, there are three states that currently have none serving, West Virginia, Idaho, Louisiana. Hmm. All places so, we're not going in, if you're paying attention. <laughs> We're never moving to a red state. So with that, <laughs> and in Linda, I hope you enjoy your travels. You are missed. Come home soon. And as Linda always reminds us, we can never forget to resist. resist.